Uh, welcome, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us virtually as we continue the 2021 Lectures in Mathematics Education series. Our seventh installment in the series and final of the fall semester will be led by Dr. Chandra Oral from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Uh, the Lectures in Mathematics Education series is sponsored by the Herman and Roche Math Initiative and the University of Southern California's Rossier School of Education, with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education. We're thankful to be able to provide access to this series virtually and for our guest speaker and everyone joining us here today. Now I'm happy to introduce Dr. Chandra Oral, who will be giving a talk titled Playing in PD, Technology, Talking and Tasks to Support Teachers' Understanding of Proportional Situations. Dr. Oral is a professor of STEM education and teacher development at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. She holds a PhD in instructional systems technology from Indiana University and has joined the UMass and joined the UMass faculty in 2010 after serving as a research, research scientist at the University of Georgia for nearly a decade. She served as the chair of the Department of STEM Education and Teacher Development from 2013 to 2017 and as the director of the Kaput Center for Research and Innovation in STEM Education from 2017 to 2020. Dr. Oral has two major strands of research. The first strand focuses on how teachers understand the mathematics they teach and how to help support teachers in better understanding that content and assessing teachers' understanding. Within this strand of her work, she has focused specifically on teachers' understanding of proportional reasoning. And the second strand of her research focuses on supporting elementary and middle school teachers to integrate computational thinking into their mathematics classrooms. Overall, Dr. Oral has published more than 80 journal articles, book chapters, and published proceedings in venues that include the Journal of Research for Mathematics Education, Mathematical Thinking and Learning, Educational Researcher, and the Journal of Mathematics Teacher Education. She has also presented over 100 papers at national and international conferences. In addition, Dr. Oral has been awarded more than 25 grants with a net value of eight, in excess of $8 million and served as chair on 10 dissertation committees while mentoring over 60 graduate students and research projects. After Dr. Oral finishes, we'll have time for questions. And when the time comes, we ask that you post those questions in the chat box and we will get to as many as we can. For the talk, if you can just make sure that you're in speaker view and please mute your microphone during the presentation. Thank you again for joining us and I will turn it over to Dr. Oral. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today about a project that we recently wrapped up that we have put in um, a proposal for extending the funding on into uh, growing it into a full size PD program. Um, but the the findings that we got out of the um, the pilot work are really exciting and I hope that you enjoy hearing about them. I wanted to start by acknowledging the Herman and Rossij Mathematics Initiative. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, Rachel Brown and James Burke are my close collaborators on this work and uh, have worked with me for several years around this and other ideas related to math teacher knowledge in mathematics. And then uh, also acknowledge my project team. Uh, the work uh, reported here is funded by the National Science Foundation and I thank them as well. <coughs> so, this entire project came out of a simple observation. I was working on um, a career grant and in that career grant, we were doing clinical interviews with teachers around proportional reasoning. And we kept noticing that when we gave teachers paper and pencil tasks, the approach they took to solving the tasks was completely different than when we gave them tasks um, in a technology setting. So we were using um, some dynamic geometry um, toys is what we've come to call them, that just let the teachers manipulate using sliders to try out different things. And the approach they were taking to the problems was different. So as an example, um, we gave them the, the top task in, in paper and pencil. This is a task that comes out of the literature. We just adapted it to an American setting. It was originally Father Christmas. 
and it asks how much paint would be used to create the larger Santa versus the smaller Santa. And what people do, what, what teachers were doing in my, in my study was they were setting up proportions and they were solving to get equivalent ratios, which gives you the wrong answer, but that's not even relevant. The point is that they went straight to setting up those ratios and didn't even think at all beyond that. They were like, oh, I've got three givens. I've got one unknown. I'm gonna solve for the unknown. And they, they just do that and move on. In contrast, we gave them the, the bears and the way that the bears work is that slider that's under it scales the brown bear, the, the bear on the right. And it scales it, um, it turns out by um, a factor of the height. So two means the brown bear is gonna be twice as tall as the black bear. Three means it's gonna be three times bigger than the black bear. And the participants can move that back and forth all they want. And we would ask them questions again, asking them to think about the relationship of the small bear to the big bear. <coughs> now, the questions are, are certainly somewhat different, but the underlying mathematics is the same. And again, the, the point isn't whether they got right answers or wrong answers. They did tend to get them right more in the technology um, environment. The point is that with the bears, they almost never wrote down anything. They went straight to trying it out, sliding it back and forth, making conjectures, talking to it, talking through it and not writing down ratios and not solving for unknowns. And so we, we kept noticing this and we started thinking, is there something that we can do based on this observation that could help us engage teachers in learning about math? Is there something inherent in this technology environment or something that we're building into this technology environment that gets the teachers to think about math in a fundamentally different way instead of going straight to the algorithms that they know. And with that, we um, embarked on this pilot study to develop a professional development that incorporates uh, the toys <coughs> and a set of tasks to see if we could, get, could um, engage teachers in the same kind of um, what we, what we call playful engagement with the mathematics that we kept seeing in the career grant. So the driving questions for the effort ended up being, can we capitalize on the observation that the PD engages teachers in meaning making, not just solving math problems, but actually making meaning out of the ideas that we're talking about. If we can create that, can we make it so that it's fun for teachers? Can we make it so that they have fun with it and that they treat it is um, a playful activity instead of as doing the work of mathematics. And if so, what, what are the tasks that support this? Because we, we certainly didn't think it was just the existence of the technology, but that the tasks had to play a role in it as well. We're working in a problem space um, when we start thinking about this, where teachers come to professional development often assuming that it's gonna be boring and irrelevant. So we're, we're challenged from the get-go that we wanna make sure that teachers see it as being relevant and see it as being engaging and not just another thing that they have to do. Um, we also know from the career grant, from other work that we've done, the teachers don't necessarily know about the underlying mathematical structures. So they may know things, in fact, they do know things about proportions. They know that it goes through zero, zero. They know that it makes a straight line, but they don't know things um, that help them translate those ideas structurally so that they can compare one kind of mathematical structure to another. So as we'll talk about later in this presentation, for example, the notion of constant, they know that there is a constant relationship in a proportion, but they don't necessarily think beyond that to what is constant in a proportion, what makes it a special kind of constant relationship, <clears throat> and what are some other constant relationships that aren't proportions. So these become cross-cutting ideas instead of just siloed ideas. We also know that students struggle with proportional reasoning on standardized tests, which suggests that proportional reasoning is a really good place to spend some time with teachers, hoping that by um, getting teachers thinking about proportions differently, that they'll give students different opportunities to think about proportions. Um, we're also working in a space where math looks a lot like it did when I was in middle school, which was a very long time ago. Teachers often are still standing at the board, doing an example, having students work more examples at their desks, the textbooks still 
often only have problems that are three givens and one unknown. Um, it, it's just not moved very far from that. And I think that, um, that that continues to perpetuate the next thing on my slide, which is a lot of people aren't good at math, but it's not because they're not math people. Everybody's a math person. The issue is that a lot of students have never been given an opportunity to see themselves as math people. And if we teach them in different ways, they're gonna see themselves in different ways. And that's um, just super important to me because I think that too often we rob students of seeing the things that are beautiful about math and the things that are really cool about math. And instead we, we convince them that they aren't math people or are math people and that math people are born, not created. And um, that math is a whole bunch of memorization when really it's about pattern finding and conjecture making and communicating with other people. So that's sort of the space we were working in. <coughs> the other important background to know um, so that you can make sense out of what I'm talking about is my theoretical grounding. Um, and I had two, I have two major areas of theoretical grounding that drive this work. One is about the way teachers know, and the other is about playfulness. For um, how teachers know, um, I draw on Andy DeSez's work on knowledge and pieces. And the reason that I do this is because knowledge and pieces asserts that people learn by um, creating a whole bunch of fine-grained understanding. So for exam example, a simple understanding might be that a proportion goes through the origin. Another simple understanding might be that um, a proportion makes a straight line. So very fine-grained understandings. And um, the way that we learn is by either having those understandings challenged and refined, or by adding new ideas to them, or by making connections between the ideas. And this is where I think things get really interesting for teachers because the more connections we have between ideas, the more accessible those knowledge resources are in any given instance, which means that if teachers have a more coherent, a more um, connected understanding, they're gonna be able to draw on more knowledge resources in the moment in classroom when students put novel ideas in front of them. So in professional development, I'm thinking not only about how do I help them make new resources or refine the knowledge resources they already have, but I'm also thinking a lot about how can I help teachers make connections between these knowledge resources so that they can draw on them in productive ways when they're in the classroom in the moment. This is very consistent with the re research on expertise, which has shown that experts not only have more understanding, which in this case would be knowledge resources, but that, that it's actually fundamentally organized in a different way from novices. And I think that 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 difference in organization is about the connections that are made between the ideas. The more connected the ideas are, the more teachers or anybody can draw on them to um, use them in a variety of ways. So part of why I like knowledge and pieces and use knowledge and pieces in my work is because it acknowledges that teachers already know a lot. I don't like um, that so much of our research on teacher knowledge is focused on deficit models and measuring what teachers don't know and highlighting what teachers don't know. Teachers know a tremendous number of things. Um, and I think Knowledge in Pieces offers us a way of honoring what teachers do know while still continuing to help push them further to know more and to um, make better connections between them. Um, it provides a way to think about how we teach adults because we're not we're not trying to just fill their head with knowledge. We're trying to identify knowledge resources that maybe need some refinement, but mostly we're trying to make connections between and among those resources um, so that they have more connected ideas instead of more disconnected ideas. So that's, that's why I work from a knowledge and uh, pieces perspective. And that's why we talk about knowledge resources uh, throughout this, this presentation. <coughs> I lost my cursor, just a second. There we go. <laughs> the other um, theoretical foundation of this work is playfulness. The research on playfulness has largely been about children. It is so grounded in the minds of the general public that playfulness is about children that we have actually had a reviewer recently tell us that they didn't understand why we would worry about playful professional development because teachers already like math, so why would we make it playful? So there's a, a very strong bias and a very strong existing research on what playfulness is 
that's very child centric. Um, I think we can draw from that though, because if we look at these definitions that are put forth by people, they still work with professional development. Um, Bruner suggested that playful activity happens when there's limited risk of adverse, uh, adverse con consequences. In order to have people behave in a playful way, whether they're children or adults, they have to feel like they're in a safe space or what they do isn't gonna have any dire consequences for them. Vygotsky talked about imagination. Uh, Barnett talked about joyous activity rather than boredom. And Kalodner talks about messing about. And we found that to be a really particularly um, interesting metaphor for thinking about teacher professional development. What if we have teachers mess about with mathematics? <coughs> so we've developed a definition of um, playfulness in mathematics that largely comes from um, James Burke's dissertation work in which he looked at teacher professional development and tried to operationalize what, play, what, what is playful about that professional development. So it was a professional development that was actually done by Rachel Brown, who's my other collaborator on this, several years ago. And it was something that we watched um, just because we we're doing some data analysis and he, he recognized that it was playful and he was like, I wonder what makes me think this is playful. And so it became a really good context to think about how do we operationalize what playfulness is for teachers. And based on his work and the work that we did in this project, we've come up with the definition that is on the screen now, which is engaging and problem solving in a way that relies on making and testing conjectures and mathematical arguments that can be reasoned about, tested, illustrated, and explained through the use of dynamic environments. So when we're talking about playfulness, we're talking about teachers interacting with each other, we're talking about them interacting with mathematics, we're talking about them interacting with technology in ways that um, are, are fun and that um, really promote discussion. Discussion is really at the heart of playfulness in our definition of playfulness for professional development. It, it happens only in safe spaces. Teachers have to feel like what, what they're exploring is okay. It's particularly important because we're uncovering things that they're supposed to be quote unquote the expert in and suddenly they're not sure that they know this anymore. So it has to be a safe space. And we drive it by using challenges, explorations, and mysteries um, that are perceived as being worthwhile. And we use those words in our tasks to convey to them, hey, this should be playful. This is a mystery for you to solve. This is something for you to explore. This is not a problem that must be solved. <laughs> um, so we really try to, to um, keep that notion going throughout. So the simplified version of our professional develop mo development model is technology plus tasks plus talking equals teacher learning. Simple. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to do is unpack what we mean by technology, tasks, and talking, and then um, share with you some of our findings on each of those four things, technology, tasks, talking, and teacher learning, um, as it relates to the pilot work that we did. So the technology, um, you're, you're more than welcome, since everybody's sitting in a computer, to go to the Caput Center website and look at per, the Proportions Playground toys. There are several toys. In this presentation, we're only going to look at two of them, the Buildings toy and the Bars toy. They are all interactive. Um, they all really play on trial and error. They're all very intentionally developed. Um, we, we spent a lot of time thinking very hard about what each toy should do and how it should behave in relationship to the kinds of conversations we were trying to foster for the teachers. Um, so in a second, I'll show you the buildings toy. And one of the decisions that we made with the buildings toy is, um, well, let me go forward and then I'll come back to this. And the buildings toy is that the, the, the building is the um, three by four block in the lower left corner. And um, you can stretch it up or you can stretch it sideways. You cannot stretch it diagonally. The reason you can't stretch it diagonally is that we wanted teachers to be very deliberate in thinking about what it means to change the size of something that you're trying to keep proportional. 
And if we made it so that the height and the width changed in a proportional way automatically, we would be taking away the opportunity to make sure that teachers were intentionally thinking about that. So when I say we made these very intentionally, those are the kinds of decisions we made. And in, um, in professional development, sometimes the teachers will ask us about that and we're very clear with them that, that that is why we did that. We did that so that you will think about going up or going over or doing both and what it means to change each of those. What does it mean to change each by two? Is that a factor of two? Is that two rows? Is that two columns? Is that two rows and two columns? What does it mean to change it by two? So those, those are the kinds of things we built into the toys. Um, the beauty of the technology is it also creates something semi-concrete for people to talk about. So rather than using hand waving or trying to draw things on the whiteboard or whatever, they can point at the screen as things change and say, do you see this thing changing too? And we all know that we're looking at the same thing because we all have that same picture in front of our faces. <coughs> so suddenly things that are otherwise kind of hard to understand become much more concrete and much more sure. And it's novel, you see familiar ideas in a new way. The teachers we work with are all teaching proportional reasoning. They, they know about proportions, they know about ratios. So how do we help them see that in a new way so that they can engage with it in a new way and have fun with it? Um, so the, um, the tasks, have to allow argument because that is where the discussion comes from. We pose tasks that are ambiguous, which is very unusual um, in math. In math, we, we pride ourselves on precision, precise language, precision of answers. We're very precise. But in order to have really good mathematical conversations, you have to have some ambiguity. And um, that's been a really interesting thing for us to grapple with in writing these tasks. They have multiple beginning places, they have multiple solution paths, they, they often have multiple right answers. Um, and that, that helps with the playfulness because then when people get multiple answers or they take multiple ways through it, we have something to talk about. So everything about this, these tasks is um, simultaneously getting them involved in the mathematics and giving them a reason to talk to each other about the mathematics. So an example, is the building codes task. So the building code task, there's actually a few different building code tasks. This is the, the main one. And it uses the building's toy if you have the um, proportions playground open. And the idea is that there's a planned community and they require the department buildings be four apartments tall for every two apartments wide. And um, the first thing we do is just have them build the buildings because this is like the first time that they're using this tool it's to see if they can create buildings that are four tall and two wide and some of the different variations that that might be. So it might be eight tall and four wide. Um, and then we give them the challenge of figuring out could a building be built following these rules that's an odd number of units wide and could a building be built that's an odd number of units tall. And this is kind of a really cool thing because first it gets them thinking about this relationship of four to two in a way that they haven't thought about it before. And it gives us a reason to talk about the difference between the real world and theoretical mathematics. Because theoretically, there's no reason why you can't have a partial apartment. But if you're living in the apartment, there's a really good reason not to have half an apartment. <laughs> so it, it's a nice place for us to um, be able to talk about that. But when we're talking about ambiguity, this is what we're talking about. There's a lot of right answers to this. There's a lot of directions the participants can go. And there's a lot of different ways that they could solve it. So what I have showing on the screen, um, the two little boxes, those are screenshots. So the um, there's a snapshot tool that lets you take a picture of the buildings as you build them so that you can compare them against the original. And then you can, um, you can line them up next to each other so that you have, you know, again, things to talk about that are more concrete so that you can look at that that's too tall and one wide and the one next to it and compare them and figure out, well, could those possibly be in proportion to each other or are those not proportional? And we do talk to them about what can be proportional so that they understand that buildings cannot be proportional, but the heights can be proportional and widths can be proportional. So we have that conversation as well. 
The final element is talking. Um, talking in our professional development is a way of negotiating meaning, uh, clarifying their ideas, making sense of the problems, making sense of their understanding of the mathematics, communicating with each other mathematically. It allows opportunities for them to, um, to develop a deep understanding of the need for mathematical precision at the same time that it helps them develop their own understanding. Because if they're not using precise language with each other, they often have to go back and keep re-explaining it until their language starts getting more precise. So it opens a door for us to talk about, it's not a constant, it's a constant of proportionality. Um, it's not two to four, it's two units tall to four units wide. It gives us a place to talk about why we need that kind of precision. So in the pilot study, um, because this was just a proof of concept to see if we could in, in fact create instruction that built on this noticing that we had that people engage differently with the technology, we created a six hour professional development that was designed to be offered in two hour chunks. And we were able to offer two sessions, um, two six hour sessions, um, each was three days back to back for two hours each day after school. So the teachers came to us, I think it was like Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, um, and then they were done. The uh, first two days focused on content knowledge and playing with these toys. And the third day focused on how do we take what we just did and put it into our classroom practices. So we had them creating their own word problems to go with the toys. We had them thinking about how it inter intersects with the, um, the standards. And we did a little bit, but not nearly enough of how the representations in the toys align to more traditional representations like ratio, uh, ratio tables. <clears throat> To help us focus the pilot study, um, we chose three big ideas from proportional reasoning, again, focusing on structural aspects of the mathematics, because we felt like that was a place for more connection making. We focused on quantity, um, constant, and covariation. And the reason we chose that was uh, a ratio is defined as a comparison of two quantities. And so we thought that starting with quantity would be a really good place to start. And we also anticipated that teachers would have a shared understanding of quantity. So it would give us all a base baseline to start from. It turns out that teachers do not have a shared understanding of quantity, which turned into a really interesting learning point for us. And it generated amazing discussions among the participants. Constant was um, always going to be in there. And it's really interesting because we really focused on what is special about a constant relationship in a proportion as opposed to other kinds of constant relationships. And covariation, we wanted them to think about what is covarying, what is the special relationship in a proportion that covaries that makes it different from other relationships that covary. So again, this is a way for them to think about mathematics that goes across mathematical ideas and not just within proportional reasoning, which um, is part of the, the goal of generating more and more connections among their knowledge resources. So an example, um, one of our mysteries simply asks, which of the situations being shown by the bars is proportional, if any? And I'll show you screenshots of these if you don't have it open on your own machine. This was <clears throat> particularly fruitful. The first two scenarios I'm gonna show you were part of the career grant. And the third one came out of some wonderings that we had from the career grant to see if teachers could really understand covariation and constant um, in more robust ways. So this is the first scenario. In all the scenarios, the blue line starts at three units long and the red line starts at five units long. That's, that's where each of the scenarios starts. And you can drag either the blue bar or the red bar, it doesn't matter. You just would click on the end of it and drag it sideways. And when you get to 10 here, you get to eight with the blue bar. And when you get to 15 with the red bar, you get to 13 with the blue bar. So this, this opens up a nice point of conversation because it, there's a constant relationship. No matter how long the red bar is, the blue bar is two units less than the red bar. But it also opens a place for us to start talking to teachers about, well, is that what we mean by constant in a proportional situation? Is that, is that a constant of proportionality? Is that, is that what we're talking about? 
So then they go on to the second scenario. And in the second scenario, the numbers don't work out quite as well um, sometimes. But if you choose the, the 10 again, so you have to choose the multiples of five and not just slide it up. This is one of the things that's really interesting. A lot of teachers will slide up by ones. So they'll go from five to six, from six to seven to seven to eight. And that gives you really wacky numbers in your blue bar. But if you do the multiples of five, you see that you have three to five, you have six to 10, and you have um, nine to 15. So then we start thinking, well, wait, that's a constant relationship too. It's not the same constant relationship that we saw in scenario one though. So is this a proportion? This doesn't look like they expect a proportion to look. They expect the proportion to look like scenario one. That is what people expect a proportion to look like. And then we go to scenario three and things get really wacky because when you pull the red bar to the right, the blue bar goes to the left. And most of the teachers will engage with this enough to figure out that there's still a constant relationship here. Most of them don't understand or don't have the language, I should say, to describe that this is an inverse proportion. But they do have the math knowledge to understand that this is a constant relationship. So this opens up yet another conversation because in an inverse proportion, we also have a constant of proportionality, but it's doing something different, right? There's a K in an inverse relationship and there's a K in a, in a direct relationship. So what's going on there? So we can have these amazing conversations about this very simple notion of constant just from these three scenarios. And doing these three scenarios ends up taking a little more than an hour when you do it in the professional development. So as I mentioned, we offered the pilot study two times in one urban district. Uh, we, between the two sessions, we had 21 teachers in one, 15 in the other. It was a very diverse group between one and 27 years of teaching experience, uh, 25 black teachers, nine white teachers, one biracial, one Pacific Islander, uh, 28 females and eight males. So we had a really diverse set of teachers. Uh, I would we did not measure their math knowledge. And the reason we did not measure their math knowledge is because we knew that in six hours of PD, we would not be able to get a measurable change in their math knowledge. So we didn't want to use any of our six hours to spend testing something that we knew we were gonna get no good data from. We do have tickets in the door and out the door from each day. So we have some measure of their understanding, um, but we don't, have, we don't have that math knowledge. Uh, measure, if we did have a measure of math knowledge, I would expect that that would also be very diverse. Um, just from the conversations we heard, I think that we had some extremely strong teachers and I think we had some extremely weak teachers. And then we had a whole variety of teachers in between. So I think that it was, um, it was really interesting. It was also really interesting to do two different groups in the same urban district because there are certain cultural norms within a district that could shape um, how you how you interpret what's going on. So to be able to have two totally different groups within that same district helped us understand a little bit about the norms of that district. For example, the teachers came in very talkative. And I think that that's a norm in that district that professional development is an opportunity for them to talk. And I think if we went into another district where that wasn't a cultural norm, we as the professional developers would have to do more work to foster that kind of conversation. Um, so each teacher sat at a computer. This is a picture from the actual professional development. Each teacher had their own computer and they sat in pairs. Um, often they would turn around to the people behind them so they would end up working in groups of three or four. It was entirely up to them who they worked with. Sometimes teachers would get up and move around the room to work with people. Sometimes they would just talk only to the person that they happened to sit next to on the first day. There were some clusters of teachers who knew each other, but there were a lot of teachers who didn't know each other in here as well. This, the district is very large. Um, I think, I wanna say there's something like 12 or 13 middle schools in the district. So um, it's a very large district and not all the teachers knew each other. So we surveyed just for some quick outcome data. We did survey the teachers each day and um, 
they they reported that they felt like the sessions were playful and they felt like they were useful. And most of the teachers said that they would use the toys in their own classroom, which was very exciting. Um, the district invited us back to do additional professional development the following year, which was super exciting because the district personnel, the uh, math coordinator and one of her assistants sat in the professional development every day. Um, the room, so it was a double wide room with a divider down the middle and they sat on the side of the room that was away from the teachers. So they weren't like in the teacher's faces, but the teachers were certainly aware that they were there. And um, they sat in it every day and they were so excited that they, they paid for me to fly back to the district to offer professional development again um, the following year to a different group of teachers. When we asked our participants about the most important thing they learned, um, we were super excited to see the number of teachers who said the meaning for quantity, covariate, and constant or who mentioned those three ideas. Um, it means that the, the work that we did to try to make those ideas front and center really paid off and the teachers recognized that those were ideas that were worthwhile for them to learn. So the key findings from our qualitative analysis, <clears throat> um, I should mention we, we videotaped every session every day we had multiple cameras. In the first professional development, we used two cameras. One was trained on, I was the instructor for both sessions. One of the cameras was trained on me when we were doing whole group work. And then it was trained on different groups of teachers when they were doing their um, desk-based work. And we had microphones to try to mic uh, the teachers who we had the video on. We found that that data was um, insufficient to capture all of the conversations going on. So the next time we went back for the second pilot, we had four cameras in the room. We were able to capture a lot more, especially in a group of 15, we were able to capture a lot of the conversations that were going on. Um, so our key findings around technology, reasoning with dynamic toys, isn't the same as reasoning on paper. Um, the, the noticing that we had in the career grant was, was true. Teachers approach the tasks differently. Um, they're very playful in the dynamic environment. They make conjectures, they test conjectures, they argue with each other. Um, they argued, some of them were like yelling at each other in a very playful way, but yelling at each other in the middle of this, they were getting so worked up about their ideas, which is super exciting to see after school, um, particularly the, the first session that we did was right before Christmas. So we're talking about like worst case scenario timing, right? We're right at the end of the, of the term. Christmas is coming, it's after school and these people are in there and they're just having the best time arguing with each other about math, about proportional reasoning. Um, the technology helped clarify understanding because they could point at the things that they were talking about and they could use language from the technology. Like they could talk about adding um, stories tall to the building or making the buildings wider. It gave them a language so that we all could get the same mental models or hopefully a shared mental model as they talked. And it helped us um, build some shared understanding. We don't think that we have any evidence that they quote unquote learned in a way that would apply to a traditional paper and pencil situation. We did a ticket in the door the first day that was the ticket out the door the last day that included a variant on that Santa problem. And there was really no improvement from the first day to the third day on that problem. So we still, whatever's happening in that space is very useful, but we still haven't figured out how to connect it back to the more traditional looking mathematics. But we saw evidence that the teachers were able to think about all the different kinds of relationships, <coughs> um, co-variation and constant and all of, the, all of those different things. And we noticed that being in, immersed in this task-based environment did not help them create tasks for their own students. So simply doing tasks like this is not enough. They need more support if they're gonna write tasks of this sort for their students, which isn't a huge surprise, but you know we have evidence of it. Our key finding around talking, they actively engaged readily in meaning-making discussions 
They asked each other questions about their understanding. They argued their points. They made and tested conjectures. They negotiated meaning. I'm going to show an example. Um, Jenny and Dora sat next to each other. And um, Dora was very confused throughout the professional development about what a constant is when it comes to a proportion. Now, Dora is mathematically quite strong. And when she would speak up in the whole class, it sounded like she understood everything she was talking about. It wasn't until we went and analyzed her small group discussion with Jenny that we started realizing that there was a disconnect for Dora. Because when she spoke up in class to the whole group, it totally sounded like she was talking about the same things that um, I was talking to them about. But in the building's task, um, so one of the first tasks on the first day, Dora turns to Jenny and she's like, this isn't working. And Jenny's like, well, you're adding two instead of multiplying. You're, you're going up two, you're going over two, you're not multiplying by two. And Dora says, I'm not multiplying, I'm adding. But I'm adding at a constant rate. How's a constant rate of change? Does that make it a proportion? So she, he, she's starting to think, my, my rate of change is constant and a proportion has a constant rate in it. Wait, are those not the same? And Jenny says, that's a good question. And Dora's like, I don't know. And this was sort of the beginning of the kind of dialogue that they had throughout. This is, this is exactly the kind of conversation we wanted them having. And it was really interesting to see it start like right away in a teacher who presented as being mathematically quite skilled. Um, she was she was doing algebra work with her eighth graders. You know, she was bringing in examples of that to talk to me about before class and stuff. So it was really surprising that this happened. And in the in the whole class discussion that followed this, I actually said something about the difference between adding two and multiplying by two. And she looked at Jenny and she's like. So I guess that adding it, adding a constant rate of change isn't right. But then the next day she came in and she went right back to adding at a constant rate of change. So change is hard and learning is hard. Um, but this is the kind of talk that they would engage in on their own um, at their desks. Another example of talking uh, came around the notion of quantity. We saw a lot of evidence in both both of the workshops that teachers don't have an actual meaning for quantity. It's a word that they use very readily that they've never stopped to think about before. And I think that um, I'm certainly guilty of it. When I went into this PD, I did not have a specific definition of the word quantity that I wanted them to walk out with. And I did not expect this to be a problem for them. So it was as enlightening to me as it was to them that quantity was such an issue. So um, Diane, this was in a whole group discussion. She had been having this conversation with her small group and this, this was not an uncommon discussion. Diane's just the person who brought it to the whole group um, and makes it clearest as far as data that this is truly an issue. So she says to me in the whole group context, when you ask the question about quantity, what are the quantities? And I did like the other kids, they all merely said the numbers. So, the quant so, so she was thinking quantity was number four to two. And I said, right, because it's quantities, it's things. So the thing that I went into this notion of quantity with, this was the first workshop. The thing I went in with was I wanted them to understand that when we're talking about ratios, we're talking about things that occur in the real world. And we're comparing numbers of those things that occur in the real world. And so I'm like, yes, it's quantities, it's things. You can't just say four to two, four what to two what. And Diane came back and said, so they'll put six. Well, what are you talking about? Is it apples to oranges? Then they'll say, oh, we're talking about such and such and such and such. To me, that's what I'm getting is the quantities are really the labels. So it's height to width. And then other participants offer in some other things like gallons. And um, there starts to be all of this um, agreement around the room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, that's you know, muttering sort of. And she's like, and now when I go back, meaning into her classroom, I'm gonna undo whatever I let them understand before. And we're gonna talk about really what quantity means because we think it's a number. Because the first thing they said to me was amount. And I said, good, 
I shouldn't have said that. So she's come up with this realization that simply putting a comparison of numbers isn't adequate for capturing the notion of quantity as a full notion. And um, she goes on to say, so this is an aha moment for me. So she, she was one of those um, participants who delightfully tells us when she's learned something new. So we don't have to infer it. She's like, this is new to me and this is exciting to me and I'm gonna take this back to my classroom. So um, to keep moving through our key findings related to tasks, I already talked about this a little bit, but we've realized that the tasks need to be ambigu ambiguous, um, which is ironic because we're using ambiguity to push to precision. Um, but it, it works, as you, as you saw in the, just the little snippets of text I gave, both of those were teachers trying to push to pr pr very precise understandings from fairly ambiguous tasks. Um, they need to be challenging. These teachers teach proportions. They know proportions. If I give them traditional proportion problems, they're not going to learn anything from that. I need to figure out a way to help them reconsider what they know. I can't give them new understandings. That's not going to work. We want them to be playful. We want to, to lower the stakes so that they can have these aha moments, even though they're supposed to be the expert. And we want to be responsive. Um, so an example of a responsive task is I kept hearing teachers talk about three to two. This was another buildings problem. And they kept talking about this three to two relationship. It shows a three to two relationship. And, and I started thinking, are we all talking about the same three to two relationship? So I created this task that said, um, a teacher asked her students to use the buildings toy to show a three to two relationship. And which of these shows a three to two relationship? So um, I gave them this example, which is um, a plus three plus two relationship or plus two plus two relationship. That's what it is. It's a plus two plus two relationship. So it's, a, it's constant, but it's not the right constant relationship. I gave them this example, which is I believe the plus three plus two relationship. So Every time we go three wide, we go another three wide. And every time we go two tall, we go another two tall. So is, is that three to two? And then I gave them this one, which goes three times three and two times two. So it, it ends up being the, the squares or the exponents, exponential relationship, which is why suddenly that third one gets so huge. So that we have a place by doing this, each of those is a three to two relationship, but they're very different relationships. So that we can figure out is one of these proportional or none of these proportional? What other kinds of relationships could they be to help teachers start thinking about this notion of constant and to help them get more precise in describing the relationships? But I would have never created this task if I hadn't have kept hearing teachers ambiguously throwing around three to two. So that's, that was a very responsive task and it worked out pretty well. So my, my final key finding is around um, teacher learning. So we said tasks and talking and technology, when you combine them, you get teacher learning. And what we've done around teacher learning is we have an emerging not, uh, model for coherent learning um, for teaching. And the PD that I reported here largely focused on the exploration phase and the application phase of this model, but doing it highlighted the need for the connection phase. And the connection phase is where we connect the, um, the novel representations of the, the toys to the traditional representations of the mathematics classroom, because asking teachers to do that on their own for themselves is challenging and asking them to go straight from the PD to their classroom without having an opportunity to do that, um, they're just not gonna be able to do it. They, they, need, they need to have an explicit opportunity to make those kinds of connections for themselves. Not because they're so difficult, but because it's novel and they just need a chance to think about it. So one of the things that we wanna do is explore what this connection phase would look like and what kinds of tasks would promote moving from um, our math tasks into the application tasks. 
The application phase, I didn't talk as much about in this presentation. What we did was we um, gave them some, we gave them a couple different tasks. One was to write, um, well, one was to fix word problems that were terribly broken. Um, and what I did was I took word problems out of my career grant that teachers had developed that were just missing, they were very ambiguous. So they were just missing all kinds of information. And we asked the teachers how they could sort of rethink those to make them more precise to address the kinds of um, mathematics we had been working on in the classroom. And the idea there was to really continue working on this notion of ambiguity and precision. And then we also worked with them to create tasks that they could use in their classroom that use the toys. And that turned out to be a lot more complicated for them than I had expected because it turns out that using the technology is incredibly generative. It generated all kinds of really fun and creative ideas for the teachers, which led them further and further away from the standards that they were supposed to be covering with the toys, which isn't bad um, because if they use the toys in other math content, that's great. But it, it spoke to the fact that we need to be um, much more careful in the way that we design the application activities so that we can make sure that they do know how to connect them to the standards and possibly so that we allow them to be generative and connect them outside of the standards as well. But I think that that's on us to make sure that we're giving the teachers clear guidance um, for what, what we want them to do. So um, that is our emerging model of coherent learning. The exciting piece about that is that the model should extend outside of just the proportions playground and we should be able to use it to design a wide variety of professional development experiences. So that's that's one of the things that we're really excited about with that. So I would love to answer any questions people have and um, you're welcome to email me anytime. And I hope that you have a chance to go play with the toys. And if you'd like the tasks, we, we have the tasks, the full book of tasks put together in a PDF. It's I want to say it's around 20 or so tasks and I'm happy to email that PDF to you if you if it's um, of any interest. So I'm going to stop my sharing. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Oral. Uh, we do have some time for some questions if anybody would like to share any in the chat box, if you don't mind. So the, the question that um, Richard asked, I think you could do that. Um, concept maps are sort of tricky. People don't necessarily know how to do them. And so um, I, think, I think it would have to be very carefully, um, very carefully crafted for teachers to make sense out of the activity. But I think that that's a, um, I think that that's an interesting idea for an activity, and maybe maybe that becomes an application activity in the PD. So we've done all of this stuff with proportions, or maybe maybe it even becomes part of the assessment, right? Like on the first day, how do you see these ideas fitting together, and on the last day, how do you see these ideas fitting together? The question would just be, can you craft it in such a way that teachers will be able to make the concept map without? the making of the concept map becoming the impediment to making making understanding out of it, if that makes any sense. So one question I have would be, how do you see this? So in the time that we have where many experiences teachers are having a virtual, how do you see the PD maybe playing out? It seems like it was heavily relied on, you know, one-to-one -one communication between teachers or groups of teachers. Mm -hmm. How do you see that playing out in an online virtual environment? So um, the, the interesting thing about this pandemic is that it got Rachel and I thinking about that exact question when we put in the grant for the new funding because we were like if we're going to put in a grant for funding in October which is when that was due 
um, we, be we better acknowledge that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that this work can go on even if we're still in a pandemic a year from now. Because in October, remember, we didn't have vaccines or anything. And she and I started thinking about it and we started talking through it. And we think that if you use, um, if you use things like breakout rooms and um, carefully crafted tasks that you can still engage teachers, it it's gonna be different clearly, but we think that you can still engage teachers in, um, in having these kinds of conversations with each other. And we actually wrote the grant so that no matter whether the pandemic is over or not, we're going to move it up at least partially online. We want to sort of develop both an in-person version and an online version, because we think that the pandemic is going to fundamentally change what teachers expect out of professional development. And this would suddenly allow teachers to participate in professional development um, anywhere, any time, even if it's synchronous, it's anywhere instead of having to go to you know, their district office or to wait for, um, wait for it to come to their district. So we're trying to think of ways to use basically breakout rooms. So each pair of students would end up in a breakout room or you know, clusters of four or whatever. It would just be a matter of um, setting very clear communication between the person controlling the breakout rooms and the teachers to make sure that the teachers ended up in the rooms that they meant to be in. And then making sure they know how to share their screens so that they can have these conversations. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Dr. Oral, for your presentation today. We're all applauding from home, I swear. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, raise uh, our next talks are starting back in January. We have our second half of the, of the lecture series coming up in January with uh, Dr. Dora Abramson, Deborah, Lohenberg Ball, Robert Berry, Eric Kunth, and Amanda Jansen will be wrapping up our uh, lecture series coming up in March. Uh, so we hope you can join us there. If you, if you registered for uh, the series for the fall, you will need to re-register for the series in the spring, and that link can be found on our website uh, and uh, in our communications through Twitter and through email. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Oral, for your time today and for presenting. Uh, it was a fabulous talk. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great thank evening. You. Thank you, everybody.